Well, it's a real honor to give the Dame Kathleen Ollenshaw um, lecture, and it's nice to come back to continue the rich tradition of mathematics that you have here in Manchester. And I'm going to talk about Socomatics, which is the title of the book I wrote, and I'm going to talk about how mathematics is having an impact on the game. Um, but I thought I wanted to start with a bit more of a personal story of my background and how I came to be interested in mathematical football. So I wanted to start by giving a bit of background on myself and how I got into, um, how I got into mathematical football. So it all started here. This is a picture of me. I'm this one when I was nine years old. And I know that this is a terrible insult. I come to Manchester, and the first thing I show you is a picture of me in a Liverpool shirt. But uh, that's how it is. I was a massive Liverpool fan when I was nine years old. The little one there in the less offensive uh, Scotland strip, he is, that's my little brother, Colin. Now, I really loved Liverpool, and I really loved football when I was small. But unfortunately, I was not very good at football at all. So when they had this thing in the school playground where the two best players would like, you know, you're in my team, you're in my team, you're in my team, you're in my team, and everyone was picked, and I was like standing there left. And the worst bit was when they said, so sometimes I'd be picked last, but the worst was when they said, you can have the rest. Like, there'd be three of us, you can have those three. So, so I wasn't really a skilled football player in any way at all. But I really did, one, one thing I really loved about Liverpool, so I was an Englishman, rubbish at football, growing up in a working class town in Scotland. So I had a sort of, yeah, I had a tough, uh, tough upbringing in this, in this sense. But Liverpool gave me this sense of identity. My family came from Liverpool and they were the best football team in the whole of Europe. So I had something that I could cling on to and feel proud of. And so that, that was always, always been in the back of my mind. And over the years, um, I was good at other things. So I was good at maths, and I was good at computer science, and I learned to program when I was very young, and I went to university, and I did very well at university. And so all of those things were, were very positive. And when I was about 21, I came here to Manchester to do a PhD. And I'd like to say that I came to Manchester because of the rich academic mathematical history of the place. But really, I was a boy who grew up in Scotland, and there was nothing better in the 1980s in the whole world than Manchester. Manchester was the coolest place you could possibly come to. So I came here to Manchester because I thought it would be a really exciting place to live. And this was where I worked. I think this building is still here, isn't it? Yep. So and I worked in this office. I think it was called P2 um, at UMIS. So I was probably one of the last people who was a PhD student at the old UMIS. And this was my supervisor, Dave Broomhead. And what was amazing about Dave Broomhead was that he gave me a lot of freedom to think about how I could use mathematics to model different things. He was a beekeeper, and he wanted to understand how bee societies worked. And he thought, well, we can create a mathematical model of it. And so a lot of my PhD was about trying to create mathematical models of bee societies. And I did that for a bit, and I went on. Afterwards, I thought, well, what else can we do? I looked at things like ant trails. This is an ant network. I studied the geometry of ant networks, how they organize their work to collect in food. I studied fish schools, how when a predator comes in to attack a fish school, they change direction as one. I studied pigeons, how they follow each other, how they use wisdom of the crowds to share information about the best route home, and how how they change direction in response to each other. And I even studied humans and how we behave socially. This is a study we did of applause in audiences. So 
if you have an audience like this, it's very common that there's a disease-like spread of applause in the audience. And also, I noticed this when you were stopping applauding here. That's a very classic disease spread. So stopping applauding. No one wants to be the first that stops applaud, applauding. But when you start to slow down, then everyone slows down, and suddenly it's completely silent. So it spreads through like a disease. And we showed this in an experiment and did some mathematical modeling. So I did all sorts of different types of modeling of social systems, both animal social systems and human social systems. This is just, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give a few more examples. This is ant trails. This is fish uh, um, escaping. This is cicadas calling. You can also measure the sound that animals make together. This is one of my favorite recent ones. We looked at mosh pits. So when you have heavy metal fans jumping around at a concert, what sort of collective patterns do you get? And they make these vortices, and they make these different things. And there's a, there's a serious application. You can look at crowd safety on the basis of this, too. Those are the clapping. We did an experiment where we had people looking up, and then we watched other people going by and saw if they looked up in response as well. And looked at sheep. This was something, this one's very small, but it's one of my favorites, actually. This was the prawns in a bucket experiment. We looked at, we put lots of prawns into a bucket and watched them go around and showed that as you increase them, they go through a phase transition of more and more collective motion. Well, we thought it was fascinating. But, <laughs> but and then there's locust swarms, that's a bigger scale. So all these different forms of collective animal behavior um, I'd studied and, and all with help of mathematical models. But I never gave up on football. It was always something which I played in my free time uh, with friends. And when I moved from Manchester to Oxford, I found that compared to my peers, I was actually slightly better at football. So I, it seemed that there I actually had a chance not to look so bad anymore. So I felt more and more confident about my skills in the game. But then a really remarkable thing happened. And I, I, well, I moved to Sweden, and it was a few years after I'd moved to Sweden and met my wife that this remarkable thing happened. The remarkable thing was this. So this is my son, Henry, when he was nine years old. And he's playing in a cup against kids a year older than him. And it turned out that Henry had all of the talent at football that I missed. He, from an early age, he really enjoyed playing. And he was pretty good at it, too. Um, my wife thinks she has the explanation for this, but um, she, doesn't, she doesn't think it's a mystery at all. But um, he is, he's, he's very into the game. And through his interest in the game, I ended up coaching his team. And I really enjoyed this. So this is, I, I sort of want to show off. This is when they were, I think they were about 10 or 11 when they were playing this match. This is my team in the black, the one who have the ball all of the time. And... <laughs> Um, and I just really got, that, that made me really hooked. I was just, it thought it was incredible the patterns that you see here. It's a real challenge when you start to be coaching to try and get them to play as a team, to move out to empty areas, to always be rolling the ball about, and actually not just dribble in this endless clump, which you often see in kids' football. So, me and the other dads, we spent a lot of time working on this. How do we get them to play as a team? How do we get them to pass each other? And in the end, we got some pretty good results. And actually, we won quite a few um, cups as well. And we had, yeah, we had some pretty good players. And I think I might be a bit over the top, because I can't let my work, um, I, I can't leave my work alone when it's my hobby. So this is a passing network I made of the kids in our team. This is the goalkeeper, left back, right back, um, right midfielder attacking, um, and this is the central midfielder and left player. And what I've made here is a passing network showing how many times they've passed each other. So the thickness of the line is how many times they've passed each other. And we use this quite a lot to try and get them to pass each other more so we'd have things like if this connection here between Frode and Niels, if that was the most common passing combination, uh, we'd say, well, you were the two best players in this match. So we'd concentrate on those type of metrics 
instead of concentrating on who scored the goal and uh, those types of things. So those types of things would improve the teamwork within the team. And also around that time when I was training kids football, I decided I wanted to write a popular science book. And my first idea was I wanted to write about the birds, I wanted to write about the fish, the ants, and all of the collective animal behavior I'd been working on. And I wrote to a literary agent in London, and I told him about my idea. And he told me, well, you know, you write okay, but nobody wants to hear all that stuff about the animals and the birds and the bees. That's really boring. But there was one little bit you wrote when you wrote about football. Now that, that is something that people will buy a book about. That is what you should write a book about. And at first I was a bit put out, but when I thought about it a bit more and thought about how I wanted to explain mathematical modeling in different ways, I thought football is actually perfect. And what ended up happening is I wrote this book, Socomatics. And the idea in Socomatics is to take all different areas of football and all er different areas of mathematics and show how they're related. Show how you can understand different aspects of football using maths and also to explain maths using football. <coughs> what I'm going to do is give you a few examples of how that actually works. This is one of my starting points. I think this was the chapter, when I started writing this, then I realized that I was actually onto something. When I could make a link between a slime mold, uh, which is one of the simplest organisms in the world, and Barcelona, which is one of the greatest football teams in the world, then I realized there must be something in this football and maths uh, idea. So what's a slime mold? Well, this is a slime mold here, this yellow blob in the center. And this is an experiment done by one of my colleagues, Toshi Nakagaki. And what he did is he, is he spread out corn fl oat flakes out like this, and then he put the slime mold in the middle. And if I press this, the slime mold should start moving. You see, the slime mold, what it does is it spreads out, and it connects up the oat flakes as it goes. First it diffuses outwards, but then you see these sort of networks building up and it gets thicker and thicker. So wherever it gets to food, it collects in the food. And eventually, it makes these networks with lots of little connecting triangles which connect up all of the food items. And in the end, it builds a network of connections between all of the food. And we can actually look at that network. So one thing I didn't say there is that these dots, the dots of oat flakes, they were placed out in exactly the organization of the suburbs around Tokyo. So this is uh, the airport, th so this is central Tokyo here, this is the airport, this is Yokohama out here. So each cornflake was placed out as a suburb of, of Tokyo. And what Toshi did with his um, colleagues is he compared the slime mold network how they connected up the food with the Tokyo Rail Network. And he found that the slime mold was just as effective at connecting up the cornflakes as the Japanese engineers were at connecting up the, uh, the suburbs of Tokyo. Now there's a sub-story to this because Toshi did this experiment with lots of different countries and lots of different places. He did it with Germany and the German rail network was just as efficient as the slime molds. Slime molds were up to the level of German efficiency. And he did it with France, with the TGV. The slime molds um, um, were exactly the same as the French engineers. They came up to the same efficiency. But then he did it with the British <laughs> rail network. And the slime molds found an even more efficient, well, <laughs> it wasn't difficult, but the slime molds found a more efficient solution to the, the networking problem than the, uh, the British engineers had done. Okay, so what's this got to do with Barcelona? Well, here's Barcelona. So we can start by admiring what probably was the greatest league team ever, or certainly of my, in my lifetime, 
This was the Barcelona team of 2010, 2011, and that player there is Lionel Messi. Now, before I started thinking seriously about football, I suppose what I would see here is Messi. He's doing an amazing job. He basically dribbles past 10 players and scores a goal. But it's also interesting to think about what his teammates are doing. This is Xavi here. You see he makes a nice pass. And then the other player in the middle, this is Xavi. And this player in the middle here is Pedro. And so what do those players do in order to create space for Messi and in order to be available to pass to him when he needs to do a pass? Well, what you can do is you can create what is in mathematics called a Delaunay triangulation of the positions of the Barcelona players. So this is now a bird's eye view of where Messi is just before he passes to Xavi. Iniesta's over there, Pedro's here. And just before he passes to Xavi, he's got a nice clean sight here. But if you actually make a triangulation, you find that nearly all the players have positioned themselves so there's lots of different passing alternatives for Messi. And what they actually do is they, the simple rule that Barcelona follow is Xavi just stands in the middle of the opposing defenders. So the, the gray ones are Barcelona, the white and black circles are the opposition team, and he stands in the middle of the opposition team. And in that way, he puts the defense on the maximum point the maximum distance between the two players. And then he can do simple, that allows him to do simple one-twos and come past. And so Xavi does this first, and then the next minute, it's very, very tight. Messi's got three players on him, but Pedro does exactly the same thing. He stands there so that there's passing alternatives. He's in the middle, so all the players are on the boundaries between them, and he can make those, those one-two passes. So it's all about creating space. Now, I don't think that Pep Guardiola, who was the manager then, I don't think that he told them to create a Delaunay triangulation so the opposition are on the edges of the Voronoi tessellation of the football pitch. <laughs> I think he said, create space. And I don't even think he said that. They just do lots and lots of training exercises, these ticky-tacka training exercises, where it pays to create space. So it comes as a very natural thing for them. But what they're actually doing when you study it mathematically is creating space in a very optimal way. So now when you look at this again, I just think it's nice to have a look at it the second time, and then you can see this thing. And if you, if you watch a game of football, you see this all the time for the, these types of possession teams, that the players are always moving into those spaces between the lines, always maximizing their distance to defenders, and that is what manages to create the, the space for these ty this type of play. This is another type of passing network. After I'd been working on this a bit, then I got in contact with the company Opta, and they collect data of all of the passes that are made during matches. So this is a few years ago now, Barcelona against Arsenal, and you just see this beautiful symmetry in their play. Um, this is, now Messi is, plays more out on the, in this, this right half space here, he plays here. Neymar is on the left and Suarez is attacking. But you see this symmetry between Neymar and Messi. You see a symmetry, of, symmetry between Iniesta and Rakitic. The lines here are how many passes the players make to each other. The position is their average position when they make a pass. And Busquets is kind of in the middle of this. He rotates the ball round, maybe passes out to the right. The ball comes back, goes out to the left. And there's just this beautiful symmetry in the way that they attack and uh, create, again, yeah, again, I want to say something about triangles here. Nice triangles, nice triangles here, and a nice triangle over all of this. So that's one way of looking at it, passing networks. Another way of looking at football geometry is a little bit in terms of evolution. So, what has happened in lots of these things is there's been an evolution of tactics. So the Guardiola played a lot of 4-3-3 when he was manager of Barcelona. And the idea of 4-3-3 is it's the perfect countering to 4-4-2 defense. So the black is the attacking team here. You have a striker who's looking to run onto the ball. And if you have three 
what you want to have is basically five players equally spaced out here. So these will be the two attacking midfielders. Then you have your, um, you have your outer midfielder here, that, oh, sorry, attacking, attacking players. And then you have your midfielders here. And you, by creating this 4-3-3 formation, you are equally spaced within a 4-4-2 defense. You're at maximum distances away from the, the opposing team. But then Mourinho came along, and this is what's so lovely living in Manchester just now, because you've got both of these two. Guardiola, he's like the, for me, he's the sort of kind of um, abstract genius of football. He just thinks in these lovely kind of patterns. And Mourinho, he's all about like ruining these patterns. But he's, he's more, but he's also to be admired because he's like an engineer. He's trying to find solutions to stop leakages. And so there's a, there's a kind of beautiful trade-off here. Guardiola is the pure mathematician. Mourinho is the applied mathematician. And they're fighting each other for, in, in Manchester. And I think this was, this was a lovely example when he was, um, when he was playing against Pep Guardiola's, Guardiola's Barcelona. Well, he put in an extra central midfielder and then stopped this type of attack. He surrendered the wings, basically, and allowed five at the back. And then when Guardiola went on to Bayern Munich, he came up with this lovely system of actually pay, playing a sort of 3-6-1 formation. So if you bring up three out here on the left and three out here on the right, then you have a really powerful attack coming in in either direction. So he exploited the five at the back in order to come up with a new solution. And this is very much what, similar to what Manchester City play just now, that they have four midfielders um, or five midfielders who are attacking in this way. Anyway, I'm getting a bit carried away with Guardiola and Mourinho. There's going to be more on them later. Okay, so a few more things on, um, on how we can use mathematics to study football. Another chapter in the book is called World in Motion. This project, again, started with my kids' team. So what this is, this is GPS on the kids in my uh, football team. And they're playing a three against three match. And they have to wait. The ball is a black dot. Um, it's disappeared just now. This is very rudimentary tracking. The blue team's got the ball, and they've run it out. The accuracy isn't very good, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea that I was so desperate to study these things at the start that I put GPS on all of the kids, <laughs> sat there noting who had the ball, and then reconstructed the correlations between the players. So these green lines show how correlated the movement of the players are. More green is more correlated. So the, these, this team is well correlated. When they start to attack, they seem to become less correlated. This didn't really work out that well. The kids thought it was great fun, and I thought it was great fun too, but it, we didn't really get much experimental things about, out of it. But you can do this. So this is, this is now a... Um, professional under-18 team, and they're playing on half a pitch. So they're playing from left to right here. So the pitch markings are for the full pitch. They're playing from left to right. And one thing I noticed here is you can see how the defense synchronize, synchronizes. So green lines mean that the, team is, the players are synchronized with each other. So now the yellow team have the ball. They become unsynchronized. There's blue lines between them. And as soon as they're defending, they become synchronized again. And the sort of thing that you can do with that information as a coach is, well, you can see which players are not properly synchronizing in defense. You can also see who's the leading player, who's the player that everybody else is following after. And this technique is increasingly used in professional football, or it's of interest to professional coaches about how you can look at the synchronization of defense. And attack is actually the opposite. Attack is more about not being synchronized. It's about being out of phase synchronized. So you can classify good attacking in this, in this same way. Another thing you can look at with this ki kind of tracking data, again, I seem to always be taking Barcelona examples, but another thing you can look at with tracking data is you can look at opportunities for passing. So this is Busquets here, and he's got four defenders to pass between, but he just manages to get this needle through the haystack of a pass to Messi in this case. And what this green area shows is all the places that he could pass to uh, with a ground pass. 
and he manages to make that pass. As soon as that point becomes available, he makes that pass. So you can use this type of thing to analyze the passing opportunities that the, the players have during a match. OK, so how is all of this stuff being used by clubs? Well, it's still pretty rudimentary how clubs are using data in football. A lot of clubs aren't using any data at all. Some of them look at some basic statistics. But there isn't a very rich, compared to American sports, there isn't a very rich use of data in modern day football. And this is a shame because, so, so I've talked to quite a few scouts and uh, one story I, I always think about is one scout told me that footballers basically, they work very hard in the morning, they train very hard in the morning, but after lunch they can just go home. And they just go home and they play computer games, a lot of them have online gambling problems. They don't have much structure for what they have to do at other times. And I think that's a lot of that is down to the player power. So the players are paid so much, that, and it's such a big risk for the club to lose them, that they don't really force them to do anything else. And this is a real shame, because actually, footballers are very intelligent. Um, I know it doesn't always appear that way when they're interviewed on television. But tests have shown that they have a spatial intelligence, above average spatial intelligence. So exactly the types of mathematical reasoning problems that we might do, connecting up dots, um, they're better at those types of tests than the average person. And so it would be possible to challenge the players and try and get them to understand a little bit more about the data behind football and how they can use that data. And I think that is happening more and more at clubs, that there's an active discussion with the players about their performance based on the data from the match. This is one very simple example of the type of thing that you can explain to a player or you can explain to anybody. This is shooting angles. Now, if you look at this angle here, so imagine the ball is at this point, there's an angle here. The ball's at that point, there's a different angle. The ball's at this point, there's a different angle. One very simple relationship in football is that the bigger this angle is, the bigger the chance you have of scoring a goal. If you're standing right in front of their goal, this is a massive angle, and you obviously have a very big chance. But if you're standing further out, this angle becomes smaller. And actually, at this point and this point, I think the angle is about the same. So the chance of scoring from here is about the same as the chance of scoring from there. So being right in front of goal gives you a very good chance of scoring. Being further out gives you a weaker chance of scoring. So there's a very strong relationship, angle to the face of the goal and your chance of scoring. And this gives you a rough idea of the probability you'll score a goal from different radiuses out. So within this area, there's a 30% chance that you'll score. In this area, there's a 15% 15 chance that you'll score. And in this area, there's a 7% chance you'll score. And these numbers are actually taken from Premier League matches. So we fit a model to predict what, um, what is the probability of scoring from different points. And I think to most people, it comes as a big surprise that if you shoot from here, you've got about a 3% chance of scoring. So I've become a very boring person to watch football with. So my friends are all like, shoot, shoot. And I'm like, well, no, you don't want to shoot from there. There's no point. <laughs> and, like, and the other thing, yeah, where I'm really boring is like when it's a free kick from here. And everyone's like, it's a free kick. This is a chance. They can score. It's like, no, they've got a 4% chance of scoring. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a corner, 1.5%. So it's just. Um, it's very, it, yeah, what, and I think a lot of it comes from the things is if you just watch the highlights, you see lots of goals from there because they look very good. They show it time after time. Let's watch those goals. We see Ronaldo scoring from there, and it looks incredible. But Ronaldo scores most of his goals from here. It's just the ones we remember that are the ones that are shown time after time which are scored from out there. Um, and so this is the type of thing that you can talk to a player about. And if they are taking too many chances from out there when they could have passed, then this is a simple diagram of, of 
the percentage chance you have of scoring from different places. And it's also a very good way, there's a model called expected goals, which has now actually made it onto match of the day and has become more popular. And expected goals basically takes these probabilities, it takes a few other factors into account, and it works out how many goals a player would have scored on average. And so you've got Lukaku over here, he scored seven goals um, up to last weekend, and he's got an expected goal score of just under five. So you could say he's been slightly lucky, but actually a, a, a five expected goal score is pretty good. He really is on good form here. You see these red dots show very high quality chances. Um, Mohamed Salah, he's uh, playing for Liverpool now. He's had this whole cluster of chances from here, and he's been criticized for missing these chances. But if you look at them, they're kind of yellowish chances. So they weren't really that great chance. And, and he scored one of them, actually, on Tuesday night. So, so now he has, he has scored from there. So it's, it, it's, you can actually evaluate how good the chances were using this. There's not a very nice angle here, so that makes the chance worse. Here, he obviously didn't miss from. Yeah, the black circle means that he actually scored. And then if you look at Harry Kane, well, he is overperforming just now. This month, he scored more goals than we'd normally expect him to do. So this gives us a different way of assessing the, um, the striker in terms of the chances they've managed to create. Now, I'm going to say, um, how can we take this one step further? And what they, uh, a company uh, called StatDNA, um, who has an analyst called Sarah Rudd, they were bought by Arsenal a few years ago. And they developed a method for assessing the quality of players based on Markov chains. Now, Markov chains are a model of randomness. And the idea is that you manage to work out what the probability is of scoring from any different place on the pitch. And so if you're in midfield, um, you can actually look at the probability the ball goes out to the wing. You can look at the probability it gets lost. You can look at the probability it gets into the box, the probability you score a goal. And you can work out from this position what is a particular pass worth. Is it, if you make a pass into the box, how much do you increase your probability of scoring? If you make a pass out to the wing, how much do you increase your probability of scoring? And you work this out by first, write, first writing down the probabilities of moving the balls to different places. You then calculate the steady state of this distribution, and you can give a value to every point on the pitch. And that is something that we're using just now to evaluate different players. So now we'll get into Manchester City. And what each of these circles is, and the lines, they're all of the attacking moves done by David Silva, David Silva in the match against Stoke, where they won, I think it was 7-2. This is all Kevin De Bruyne's passes. The arrows, the arrows show very important passes, and the intensity of these circles show how important that pass was on the basis of the Markov chain. So a light color means not very important. Dark color means very important. And you can actually get an idea of where these players are playing very quickly from these plots. So you can see this is exactly what Raheem Sterling does so well. He gets in the box, cuts the ball back, and he's made five of those passes during the match. Um, Sané does it on the other side. De Bruyne makes these lovely passes um, further into the box, and Silva is just about everywhere. I should have made, maybe put in a contrast because what is amazing about Manchester City just now um, is that the players are everywhere. So instead of having a sort of fixed position, Silva is wandering everywhere around the fit pitch. So is De Bruyne. They're changing, different, changing to different positions, and that means that they're creating a lot more chances than, than usual. We can also um, evaluate defense in this way. This is... Phil Jones, he had a lot to do on Saturday. Um, and every circle here is the quality of clearances, interceptions, and tackles he made in the match against Liverpool. And we even have a way now of comparing players um, within a match. So this was the Liverpool 
Manchester United match. It ended nil-nil, so I was a bit disappointed with that, but I could at least console myself that uh, eight of the ten top players in that match were Liverpool players, and Man United's best player was their goalkeeper, because he made some sort of miraculous saves, which no goalkeeper should be able to make. And, uh, and Phil Jones, who was just basically clearing the ball out of the penalty area the whole time. So you can get some assessment of comparing different players on the basis of how much they increase or reduce the chance of a team scoring. So I'm now, what came, um, Peter mentioned this thing with a computer game. So one thing we're working on is a fantasy football computer game based on this Markov chain analysis. So we're trying to have an advanced algorithm for assessing football, and you can sit there live during the match with your three favorite players, and they'll get points for every positive thing that they do, uh, positive points for positive things they do, and negative points for negative things they do during the match. So that's something that we've been working on recently. Well, I'll just, so I'll just very quickly, and what you can do is if you want to ask me questions about this, you can ask me about various chapters, but I'll tell you a little bit about the different chapters of the book. There's this, I never predict anything and I never will. This is a quote from Gaza. Um, Tony Blair has also said it, apparently. And, um, <laughs> and it's all about randomness in football. So there's basically two thirds of football is random. Although there's a lot of patterns, there's a massive amount of randomness in the outcome of a football match. Uh, Total Cyber Dynamo is all about how teamwork and how teams should play together. Check My Flow is about, um, that's a bit like those passing things I've been showing you, the world in motion I've talked about. I also go outside the ground, and, or I, sorry, I go into the crowd, off the pitch into the crowd, and talk about spread of chanting in the uh, chapter You'll Never Walk Alone. I also talk a bit about the mosh pit there. Um, Zlatan Ibra, I, you know, I live in Sweden just now, and this was a massive, when Zlatan Ibrahimovic scored this goal against England with the bicycle kick, this was a massive event in my family. My wife was like doing her own bicycle kick around the, around the living room. And um, so I describe a little bit of, about the uh, mathematics behind that. Then one thing I did that some people might be interested in is I took some of the advance I got for writing the book and I tried to win money on the, um, uh, at the bookmakers. And I actually won some money at the bookmakers. The only twist in this story is I also gave some money to my wife to try and win money at the bookmakers, and she also made money. So, and she did it using this system she had, which she could never quite explain. She picked the teams that were winning a lot or something. So I, did, I do a very rigorous, I have a three chapter rigorous analysis of how you might try and win money betting at football, and she could also do it with her method. And I have a bit on game theory and points for uh, why you should always go for three points. Mourinho is stupid to go for a draw against Liverpool. He should go for three points, but he did it. And um, so there's an explanation why you should go for three points for a win. The last thing I wanted to say is a sort of slightly deeper message about the book, because in the end, although I gave in to the publishers and my agent and wrote a book that was about football, the book is actually three-fifths football, and it's two-fifths um, other parts of science. And I actually learned a lot about science by thinking about football. I actually saw how important it was to relate, um, relate mathematics to real examples. So I often think about, I talk a lot about my son being good at football. I, my daughter isn't interested in football. And we went, she went and tried a few times, but wasn't so interested. And I think about what sort of things are interesting for her in, in a book about football and mathematics. And I think the message that was important to me was how you can take applications in all different types of areas and apply, them, apply mathematics to them. And another thing I've learned from all of this is that I'm still training this team, and we're very careful in our team that everybody gets to play. It's not just about having the best players, and it's, we certainly don't do any of this picking and you can have the rest type of thing. There is a part of football for everybody. There's, there's the thinking part of football, there's the physical part of football. Everybody can enjoy football. 
And I think that's what I want to say. So thank you. So any questions? Otherwise, I can just continue on a random chapter. <laughs> um, this is all related to premiership clubs. You've done the analysis, really, with first-class football. Mm. Do you see a difference when you start looking at international sides? Um, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, there, there is a difference. I mean, they don't... They can't rely as much on teamwork and knowing the other players in the team because they don't play together to the, to the same degree. There's some interesting things. So I looked at, for example, in England's last, um, in the um, Euros, they basically built on Tottenham Hotspur's system to a degree. They were the most successful team in the Premier League and they played six players in the positions that they played for Spurs and then just put in players which fitted into that system. So that's about as far as, as I've looked at the international. It tends to, I mean, it's, it's funny because most people are more interested in international football than club football. But if you're interested in the sort of dynamics of things, then it is nicer to study club football because you can study the patterns. It's not as random as it is in international football. Yeah, well, that's... As a Liverpool fan, <laughs> <laughs> Analyzing Jurgen Klopp against Pep Guardiola, how would you sort of assess him against some of the other managers in the Premier League? So Jurgen Klopp has this very fast attacking style of football. So it's basically about getting the ball back and starting a um, rapid counter-attack. And it's been very clear actually for Liverpool this season that whenever they're playing against a good team, they do really well because they're pressed back and they can do counter-attacking. He doesn't seem to have much of a strategy for breaking down teams, which Guardiola has. So Guardiola is really the master of, of this possession football. And Klopp's teams, they do have more possession, but they have, they have less, Liverpool have less possession now than when they played with Brendan Rodgers, actually. So their game isn't built up to the same degree about as, as possession. I think... Both, but both Klopp and Guardiola have their particular style and they stick to it and they try and win with that style. And I, I think that's very nice. Mourinho doesn't have style. No, he, do, he doesn't have a particular style. He has a, um, a method of beating the opposition. He does whatever is needed to beat the opposition. And just one yeah, question, sure. if that's okay. Are there any other sort of young managers that you have analysed that you think... Are oh. sort of following in Guardiola's kind of footprint. That's a um, yeah. There's actually so there's a guy called Rene Maric who is now the assistant analyst at or he is the an, first team analyst at Salzburg. And I spoke to him a lot during the um, process. And he was a good football player, but he was injured when he was 18. He's now 23 or something, and he he's just this totally consumed person of the theory of football and he explained a lot of the theory of football so if there was I don't know how it is to make it as a manager but he really struck me as somebody who who could be extremely successful oh yeah I'm also a Liverpool fan <laughs> oh well um, then I was right, the right <laughs> audience here <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I think I read in the introduction before this lecture that you, there was a suggestion that um, you'd looked at how much of Alex Ferguson's success <laughs> was down to luck, and I would just like to take that evidence back to the office, if I may. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. It, a lot of it is, of course, down... There, yeah, there's a lot of skill, and there is a bit of luck involved. You can't win that many times without some luck. But I, I didn't make an analysis of Alex Ferguson's Oh, no, maybe I didn't bring this. Okay, so 
if I re-simulated so re the league the year um, when Suarez was playing for Liverpool and we nearly won, so which year? That was like three, three seasons ago. And what you can do is you can measure the probability that a team will win by re-simulating all of the goals they scored during the season. And if you do that, Liverpool won that season 25% of the times, and City won it like 38% of the times. So that's one way you can quantify those things. So when you see a season where Man United won the league, there were these narrow seasons when they won it, you actually see that they, had a, they won it, but they had a 35% chance of winning it. So you can really quantify how much of this thing was down to luck and how much of it's down to skill. And I think that's really, the whole analysis of randomness has really affected the way that I look at football. You hear all of these stories about the changes the managers made, the, the new players coming in and so on, but nearly all of that is noise. And even if you win the league, there's quite a lot of noise in it at the end. There's two or three teams that could equally well have won the league at the end of the season. So, of course, Alex Ferguson was a brilliant manager. There's no doubt about that, unfortunately. But he did also have luck in various seasons. Hi. Um, I support Preston North End. So <laughs> I, I've just I got would, an analysis here of their... Uh... <laughs> I would love them to benefit from some of the work that you've done, but unfortunately, we're not in the Premiership. Hmm. Um, many years ago, there was a lot of work done around Route 1 football, uh, yeah. which I think was based around Wimbledon. Have you looked at that, and is there any evidence or uh, benefit to it? Yeah, I did, because I, when the book was coming out, everybody said, well, this is all very good, but can you explain why Leicester have won the league? And, um, and it was actually... I, I, look, I did a study where I looked at how far across the pitch and how far up the pitch Leicester were passing the ball successfully. And they actually, on average, they were making passes that were three meters longer than any other team. And their average pass was 10 meters forward compared to seven meters by the, uh, most, the next most successful team. You had teams who were crossing the ball longer, but this direct pass forward, which Leicester City did over and over again, that really explained why they were successful. And I think other teams worked that out by the next season and eliminated a lot of that. But there, it's all, that, there's always a possibility of that type of thing working um, against teams. Guardiola has a system to try and prevent it, but that type of tactic is always going to have some value. Um, hi. Um, so a lot of the graphics you've shown have mm. shown sort of the network for a 90-minute game, say... But have you done any work on how the patterns of play change as the game progresses? So say as players start to tire and subs come on, or another player, um, or say one team's trying to um, hold on to their lead while counter-attacking while the other is doing everything they can to equalise and go on to win the game. Have you done anything on that? Yeah, well, we certainly develop tools which do that type of thing. Um, but I wouldn't say that we've systematically done it, uh, done it. So I don't work for any club. I've had like kind of small projects with various clubs. Um, but that is the thing that I envisage that they should be doing in the future. You know, we ha they know what system they're employing. And so they know if they're getting the outcome that they want. What's difficult as an external observer is you don't know what the manager told them to do. So often you'll see this like one player seems to be making all the defensive interceptions and so on. And I've talked to coaches before and said, well, he's really good, you know, he's doing all the interceptions. It's like, well, that's his job. You know, that's, that's the role that he has that we assigned him, so he's just doing the job. Doesn't mean that somebody else couldn't do it as well. So I think that ultimately these things have to be integrated into clubs and players have to buy into them in order them, for them to work. Okay. Yes. So um, thanks to David for a really excellent talk. I can't think of another occasion when I've been to a, a mathematics-related talk with results that are five days old. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm a real, real fan of you know, using mathematics in somewhat unlikely places, and this is a really fine example of that. So uh, they will be joining us outside in the lobby for, uh, for some drinks, and there's also an opportunity to chat to David some more and also to, to purchase 
Yes. So anyway, I'd like to thank David uh, one more time. Thank you. Thank you.